What is going on, y'all? Welcome to 8 Cubes. I'm Cam Best. He's Lambie Series. We are two, still technically, of Marvel Snap's best players here to talk to you about the eight most important topics in Marvel's Snap. Now, we're going to start out with a card coming out on Tuesday. That is Malekith. Malekith, the Dark Elf Enemy of Thor, a 4-6 with an on reveal ability that pulls a card that costs three or less out of your deck. Actually, I believe it's technically one, two, or three, so no pulling wasps mm. here. And we'll put it on the board face down, similar to a card played under Supergiant. It will be revealed at the end of the game. It's sort of a one-unit dark dimension of a card. But at 4-6, there are a couple of really interesting things that this card can do. I think the first one is this is a deck thinner. This is a card that gets a card out of your deck that you probably don't want to draw later in the game. Second thing this does is just be good stats. A 4-6 plus a 1-2 or 3 drop is, like, pretty good for 4. The third thing is it can allow you to do some specific things that your opponent might not be aware of. You get to know what that card is. They don't get to know what that card is. So you get to play with that additional information. Maybe it's a hazmat. Maybe it's a loot cage. Those are the kind of cards under a Malekith that can really make a difference in the game. Lambie, what is it that you think you're going to be doing with Malekith on first glance? Yeah, so there's two things that I, I can think of straight off off the bat. So the first thing that I can think of is that I, I really don't like playing against this kind of cards. Because you mentioned you mentioned Super Giant, right? So Super Giant just adds a layer of like uncertainty when you play against it. This is one of those cards again, right? Like it adds a, a layer of uncertainty when your opponent plays it down. Because when they play it down, it's a 4-6, yes. But then the 1-2 or 3 cost card, you, you don't have any idea what it actually is. So, like, it's very difficult to snap or retreat or calculate point potential when you are playing against this level of uncertainty, you know. Because you know it's for sure, like, for the most part, like, your opponent is definitely adding some amount of stats there. But you don't know how much and you don't know if the it's not just stats. You don't even know if it's an effect that will impact the end of the game as well, right? So, playing against this card low-key annoying. But I think I think it's a good... It's at, on, Overall, I think it's a, quite, a, quite a good card, though. Because, like, you mentioned deck thinning, right? I think deck thinning is super important. Especially if you're playing this on 4 and you're thinning a 1, 2, or 3, means you're thinning towards a 5 or 6, right? That you can top deck and play, you know? So, I actually, I actually really like this card like in general I just find it that I just think that it might be really annoying to play against Uh, in general decks that I think this can go into I feel like it's difficult to play this in like a combo style deck because it's a bit too random but like a bit like anti-venom I feel like this is good in decks that whereby you can just kind of pull anything and it doesn't really matter Uh, the upside of this obviously is you pull like a curated like card right like 1, 2 or 3 so like you you can realistically top deck like the 5 or 6 so I, I think this might be I'm, I'm, I'm more in favour of this card than Super Giant like just no, sorry, not super giant. Then anti venom, just uh, from like the first glance of it. So that's actually interesting because my instinct was if this card released before anti venom, I feel like it has a lot more upside. I'm not sure if it has that same upside releasing alongside anti venom. Maybe they both get run in the same deck. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but it is sort of striking to me like how much every deck I would play this card in is also a deck I would play anti venom in, and right. how stuck I am on figuring out like. I find it hard to believe that this card is meaningfully better, but maybe it is because of that pulling hazmat and loot cage and things like that, right? Like, maybe that is actually just true. Here's the other thing. If you pixie, will it look at those costs? Can you, like, oh, pixie true. into pulling a free six drop off of this kind of deal? Is that the kind of thing that you can do with Malekith? Because if that's true, suddenly he gets really interesting for those decks. I want to know about that. And I think finally, the thing that I really think of when I see Malekith is I am devastated for this card that they nerfed Sandman the way they did. This is an mm. unbelievable card for what old Sandman was, and I worry it might be homeless outside of having that easy fit in. However, if like the instincts that I have are this goes in your Luke Cage hazmat decks with anti-venom and it maybe goes in your pixie decks. And I do feel like right now there is a type of deck like that that is good. I feel like there probably is a 12 that you can put together that will have this card be a beneficial part of it. Ultimately, you go ahead. Yeah, no, sir. I, I, was, I was just building a deck in my brain right now and I suddenly got a bit excited because like you want to play because you mentioned you want to play this in your Malekith and you mm -hmm. want to play this in your Anti-Venom deck as well like this and Anti-Venom in the same deck and plus Affliction strategies right I kind of feel like then we can just throw in a Zabu as well then you can play this on 3 you can play Anti-Venom on 4 then you just fit everything perfectly right because this might pull the Hazmat Anti-Venom might draw the free 
Ajax at a, at a higher chance now because you pulled a smaller one with Malakith on turn 3 after you played Zabu on 1. Like, it's a deck, you know? Like, it's... Yeah. Because I talked in our previous video whereby uh, the Affliction strategy sometimes struggle to, like, play everything. I feel like playing this and playing Anti-Venom in your Affliction deck literally lets you play the whole deck by turn 6. So... Very excited, actually. I'm probably going to just buy it and then YOLO this in yeah. and see how it hopefully works. Like, yeah. that's the deck that I keep building in my head with this card, for sure. Is, like, some sort of deck that looks a bit like what you described there. I also wonder, I think ultimately my big question for this card is how good is the deck thinning? Because if the deck thinning is really good, this card is really good. Like, a good on-rate body that the deck thinning really actually matters in, that's a really important card to have in a lot of stuff. And if that ends up being an important part of this card, this card could, I'm not going to say, I'm not saying it's going to get to like America Chavez level staple, right? But it could be the kind of card that's like just sneakily in a lot of decks that can afford it. Agree. The other question though, is how much of a downside is having this stuff pulled out of your deck? Right now, one of the most defining cards in the metagame is Shadow King, right? If that gets pulled out of your deck, you're not going to be able to target it. It will hit whatever's in that lane at the end, but like you generally want to be able to pick the lane you Shadow King. And so it sort of comes with upsides and downsides, but the this card looks like it has a lot of potential to me. I wasn't sure when we were supposed to talk about King Atree. He's been data mined as like an event reward card. And as far as I know, there's not an event in the game at the time of recording this. But he is a 1-2 with an activate ability that draws a card out of your deck that did not start in your deck. He is a Thor card. I mean, King Atree, Asgard, right? He's the guy who made Mjolnir. Of course, he's a Thor card, right? Uh, he's also kind of a Thanos card in as much as anything is a Thanos card, which is not really because he's not very good right now. But this is an interesting little piece in like Arishem, Thor, Thanos. I think it's like a, a solidly reasonable card. And I wanted to talk about it now in case like because i know high voltage was like announced uh like a week before it came out like i worry basically what'll happen is we'll do this video it'll come out and then on tuesday they'll announce an event and it'll start on like friday or thursday and then we won't have talked about king atree so we're gonna do it now king atree i think is purely a thor card but i am not sure it would be a thanos card if thanos were not unplayable yeah, dude, I love this card so much, man. Oh, firstly, firstly, I don't think the Thor deck will be super strong. Prove me wrong. But like, mm -hmm. this is insta included in like a Thor or Beta Ray build deck. Simply because I think it's just better Jane. Like, I know I know Jane draws more things, but Jane costs five. This one draws like the hammer and then you have four more mana on turn five to like do whatever, right? Like, I, I think well, this is actually really strong. You have to play it before yeah, then. So but yes. Yeah, kind of, kind of. But like, after that, like the Jane turn is not just Jane. The Jane turn is King A3 King A plus flexible stuff, right? So I think that's like one thing it has going for it. Also, also the moment we mentioned Thanos and then people that love Thanos watch this like, like video, they will just go and play this in their Thanos deck, whether Thanos is good or not. Like, 100%. Uh, I, I like I like the RHM call out though, because, because, I, I know Arishem, even though this draws the random Arishem card, I feel like Arishem, any kind of thinning in yeah. Arishem is actually kind of like decent. Heck, even playing Malekith in Arishem might be actually something to consider as well. But like, honestly, honestly, I really like this card a lot. Uh, Simply, okay, I mean, like, I like deck thinning. I like curated, uh, draw curated RNG. But the fact that this thing costs one, it gives it a lot of flexibility. I don't know how good it's going to be in general, but like, like in a vacuum, I don't know how good it's going to be. But like, it's a very clear use case to be a Thor card for sure. And also, it's cheap. So like, it can't be that bad. Like, I, yeah. I would experiment with this card for sure. Here's one thing that really sticks out about this card to me, though, is that, like, all the Thor decks that people build tend to be... The dominant versions of them tend to be, like, alt Sarah decks, basically, where mm -hmm. they're, like, playing Killmonger Shadow King stuff with their hammers on the final turn of the game. And is this card being one cost actually bad for that? <laughs> like, would this card be better in that deck if it were a 2-3? That was an actual question. I want, I... Oh, 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 I thought we were done. No! I, I think, I, I don't think so, though. I don't actually think so. I was asking you. The, no, okay, so you want to play, okay, so let's say, let's let's say we talk about the Sarah case, right? You want to play this on three, and then I guess you want to play this on, no, you want to play Thor on three, you want to play this on four, you want to play Sarah on five. I don't no, think no, it's no, one, no, two, no. I don't mean like, like, I don't mean like a literal Sarah deck. I mean like, you know, they, they're, they're like Thor decks that go like, Thor, Bill, Jane, Throw Priority, Killmonger, ah. Shadow King, and uh, and guys. So you're saying that if this gets blown up by Killmonger, it might yeah, be it's bad, issue, right? right? Yeah, but it's just minus. It's like you you spend one mana, 
to get a zero six cost hammer zero six and yeah. then you blow it up with Monga, I think it's fine. Okay. It's yeah. something that occurred to me. Because like I mean uh, there's also the other kind, right? There's the other kind of Thordex where you're just like doing lockjaw stuff. And mm. this is really good there. <laughs> like this Great. is really good for a lockjaw kind of Thordex. Wait, I need to add one more thing. I just realized. I just realized because you mentioned Lockjaw, right? You can go like Beta Ray Bill on 4 and then Lockjaw plus this on turn 5. You can't do that with Jane. So this is like way more efficient, you can't, right? You, you can can't do... do that though. Like, You can, you can. No, you can't. Why this not? is an activate card. Oh my god, this whole time I thought it was on review. That's why I was trying. That's why you, I was confused at everything you were saying. I was looking at the card, I was like, on review, draw a hammer, oh my god, it's activate, okay, fine, fine. So it's a strictly talk, I'm not even... Yes! Sorry, like, you, you, I, this is like, every time you were talking about, like, oh, you'll play it on turn 5, it does nothing if you play it on turn 5! <laughs> I kept thinking it was on review, okay, so everything I said that had to do with turn 5 or later, scrap, and if everything I said that had to do with turn 4 or earlier... <laughs> we're leaving all later. of this in. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Frigga in review. Now, Frigga in review is a card that I think is pretty okay, but it's hard for me to believe that it is required to do the things that you're going to need to get out of a card to make it worth the purchase, basically. I've had a lot of success playing this card. I played a lot of, like, really good, you know, Moon Girl, not Moon Girl, uh, Move Bounce type decks that were using this card very effectively. I think it was important to those decks. But I also think you could very easily cut it for any other card that is functional in the move bounce shell. Like, I wasn't playing Doctor Strange. You could cut Frigga for Doctor Strange very easily. Uh, that's an easy, 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 easy swap to make. Like, you can make a lot of different swaps in and out when it comes to that shell. And I don't think she's necessarily required. She's more like card 11, a little bit of a card that, like, helps you in certain spots, is a useful card. I have liked her. But ultimately... If you're opening these caches, I think the most compelling argument to open for Frigga is that she's paired with Copycat and Red Guardian, which are cards you are almost never going to be sad to have. A lot of people have been asking me, what can I play instead of speed in my Wiccan deck? And Copycat is always a great option for that. Red Guardian is always a great option for that. Like, these are cards that are going to be... In the 95th percentile of three drops, as far as I can tell, basically forever. <laughs> like, they're just that good. And so very often, they serve as great replacements for cards that you are missing, as long as those cards are doing something generic at the three cost slot. If you're just playing speed for stats, you can absolutely replace them. The kind of things those cards can't replace are something that is integral to the game plan, that cannot, that is not just like a good card. But those are... Probably the most compelling reason to open Frigga Caches right now. Yeah, I, I like how this title says Frigga Review, but it's actually Frigga Spotlight in Review. Well, because, we have to talk about it like that. Yeah, I know, I know. Because, like, I personally don't like Frigga as a card. The more mm -hmm. I... Like, I keep talking about the card in, like, previous videos. Then the more I look at the card, the more I think about the card, the more I don't actually like the card. And yeah, I actually think the Spotlight is, is pretty good, right? Red Guardian is great. Uh, Copycat is great. I guess Frigga is, like, an okay card. But like yeah. you said, right? Like, even in the Move Bounce Shell, it feels like she could be any other card, like, a budget option or, like... Loki Doctor Strange might even be the better card sometimes, you know. Sometimes. Might be. So yeah. like yeah, right. So like so like I feel like Frigga just feels like I want to play a new card. Uh and yep. it kind of works in move bounds, but it, I don't need it. So yeah, I guess the cash is good. I, I don't really have much else to say. The cash is good. I have one more thing about like Frigga, specifically her stat line that I want to talk about, but that'll be like later sure. down below. And uh I think more explicitly, I would say definitely do not spend six thousand tokens on her if you're watching yeah. this after the fact. Probably not worth it. On to a much easier card to review, Surter, uh, the Battle Pass card. Even if this wasn't on the Battle Pass, this would be a you-should-get-this-card kind of card. This is a card that instantly unlocks a very good deck for you. But I did want to talk about one dynamic that people have been pointing out to me that I didn't really notice because of my position of privilege in the Marvel Snap community, which is they released a card that synergizes with Scar. And you need Scar to play this card. And Scar came out a year ago. It's like 11 was months ago. Was it already ago. a year? It was January. Scar was a kinda. January card, I want to say. That was like the Scar season. He was the season pass card in January, I think. He has not series dropped. So you missed that season pass. He cost 6,000 tokens. And this card that just came out is unplayable without him. And I have lauded the Marvel Snap development team in the past 
for making cards that hook back into other cards. We have playable Quicksilver decks now because of Wiccan, and they did that on purpose. They were explicitly trying to make these cards work together. They wanted to have Quicksilver work with Wiccan. They also wanted to have Kate Bishop work with Wiccan. That's happening right now. Here's the thing that is also happening, though, is those cards were explicitly designed to hook into Series 1 cards that were not very good. Marvel Boy was designed to hook into Squirrel Girl. Wiccan was designed to hook into Quicksilver. With Surtur, they're hooking into a card that is still Series 5. And that has a much different dynamic in terms of how a card is received. Because if you just have one of these two cards, it is kind of unplayable. You don't want to be playing Surtur without Scar, and you don't want to be playing Scar without Surtur. And that is a bad dynamic that I was not really functionally aware of, but like it's a consequence of these lack of series drops, of this inability to access old cards, of the fact that like these cards it's so important for a card like this to have the option to pick up the card that works with it in the caches. And if they whiff on that because of whatever scheduling concerns that they have, they end up making a deck that should be accessible and relatively easy to pick up. And frankly, they're kind of probably losing out on money, not putting Scar in the caches right next to Surtur. Uh, people would be opening for that. It, it just sort of feels like I don't understand why this didn't happen. I don't understand why... They're hooking into a card that people probably can't buy. I would imagine it only depresses the sales of Surtur, and you're missing out on the potential value of people opening the caches for Scar. Actually, I think that's super spot on. Like, I don't have much to add for this one. I said first thing I want. I just want to say is that I think this is like they hundred percent knew that like you want to play Searcher with Scar, right? Like, there's no way that they didn't know yeah. this was the best possible way. It's to play like the card, explicitly so. designed yeah, to be obvious, a three right? drop that discounts Scar. Like, that's yeah. what it does. And then the second thing that you mentioned, which I think is, like, super smart, yet they didn't do, was, like, putting the Scar in, like, this week's spotlight. Like, it makes... It would make so much sense, you know? Like, it would totally drive up the sales because, like, your Searcher card is, like, only going to be playable with the Scar. And then if you put Scar in the spotlight, everybody's going to open because there's, like, two good hits, right? And you make a completely, like, playable, quote-unquote, new deck after opening your caches. So, like, it makes a lot of sense. They didn't do it, though. So, sadly, uh, I guess we make more sense over here. I don't really get it. Like, it just feels like they're throwing money away on two fronts. They're depressing the sales of the Battle Pass by hooking it into Scar and not giving Scar the availability of it. And they're also probably losing out on some cash opens that they would get if they had Scar in them. It, it doesn't feel like okay. a decision that I like. Semi-related, but also unrelated. Hmm. If we were to remove Copycat or Red Guardian from this cash for the Scar, which would you remove? I would remove Copycat. Okay, same. I, I like assuming I'm trying to construct the best cash. I'd remove copycat. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about do we want them to nerf stuff? We had a little bit of the let them fight meta with Agent Venom and Scar. Do we think things need to happen about this? Is it time to start thinking about addressing Agent Venom? Is it time to start thinking about addressing Surtur? Is that what we need to be doing right now? Is that the conversation we need to be having? Are there any is there anything egregious in the metagame that really sticks out to you as something you want to deal with? I mean, for me, straight up, the because we had, we had this whole let them fight scenario for a few videos, right? And I yeah. think, like, at the end of the day, I think Agent Venom is still definitely the better card and overall the better deck. I think it's fine now to just, like, put a bit of a uh, damage to the Agent Venom yeah. deck. By not doing too much, I feel like Agent Venom should keep its effect. But Agent Venom should be, like, a 2-2. It, it, you shouldn't have Agent Venom to be, like, a powerhouse that also buffs your whole yeah. deck, you know? I, I don't mind if Agent Venom is... Bast level of stats because Bast is the one one right. Bast doesn't feel good to play, but it does what it's intended to do. So I guess I want Agent Venom to be a good card that does what it's intended to do, but not a powerhouse on its own as a stat machine. Yeah. So I guess Agent Venom two 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 one. You might actually see a downtick in the play rate of the card already. I think you honest. might but, kill it. Like that's a really yeah, it's bad, a bit bad right? <laughs> like, the thing, is, but the thing is, the stuff that it supports is insane. Like it yes. just made Iron Man one of the most played five drops in the game for like a month, right? So like I feel, I feel like I. I feel like definitely 2-2, two, two, I would play 2-1, I would consider it. But I think we should do something about the stat line of Agent Venom. I low-key want Claw to come back. Like, I feel like I feel like Claw just kind of went down for the, because the deck was popular. But yeah. I, I think Claw can come back, honestly. And when it comes to, like, unplayed cards that I wish would get buffs... For the oh, no, no, don't do worry something. about that. That's the next topic. 
Okay, okay, okay. I forgot. Yeah, 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 yeah. just there. But yeah, that, that's uh, basically all that I have to say about this. So I just want Agent Venom to be toned down a little bit. They definitely shouldn't touch Searcher because firstly, mm-hmm. uh, not everyone has access to Scar anyway and it's also like just a new card. So like, I feel like, what's the point? It's yeah. not even the best deck. The Agent Venom point, I think, is salient. Uh, I, I've got a theory about Agent Venom and I think the okay. theory was they wanted it to be kind of a Cerebro card and in so doing... They were mm. like, we need to make the number that it sets to the same as its power so that this can be a Cerebro card. And I think that what I've learned from Agent Venom here is don't do that. It's not going to work. Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Just, just release the, the most balanced version of the card. And I, as much as like it might be a little bit ugly to disjoint its number from the number it sets things to, I think that some sort of disjointing is likely necessary. I do kind of wonder, like, okay, hear me out. What if it's a 1-3 that sets everything to 3? Isn't that just Bast, but a bit different? Yes, it's just, it's Bast. It's Bast, but a (laughs) 1-3. I don't think they'll do that. I don't think they'll do that. That is exactly what it is, yes. Yeah. No, I want to talk a bit about the the whole, like, Cerebro thing for a bit. Because the only and last time I ever heard about, hey, Agent Venom could be a Cerebro 4 card, was literally us like before the card Yeah, like released, the day it releases the only... and then everyone plays it and it's terrible. <laughs> it's the only time it ever happened and yeah. it just disappeared into oblivion thereafter. Yeah, it's uh, it's probably not worth trying to keep that functionality around. Let's talk about some buff wishes. Are there any cards that you just are sick of seeing be bad? I mean, okay, so I, I, I kind of wanted to talk about it about in the previous topic. Then I realized that we actually kind of have a topic for it sure. right now. But like, so off the top of my head, I, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even a suggestion that was like, like supposed to affect the meta or not. It's just that it's because I like the card. I like Punisher, man, and Punisher is so unplayed. It's like Ooh. the most unplayed card, one of the most unplayed cards ever. I just like the card, you know. Like sometimes you just like a card, right? And I just like Punisher, so I want Punisher to be buffed. Uh, I, I want. Okay, this one might be a hot take and might be a dangerous thing to even consider. I want my old Sandman back because I feel like there's so many ways. <laughs> I feel like I feel like there are so many ways to play old Sandman now. Like like with the whole anti venom thing, then you drop two cards on the Sandman turn and something like that. Okay, that's kind of maybe too busted, but but like yeah, I want to play old Sandman again. I have one, and okay. I think this is gonna be a really controversial one. Okay. I think they should buff Doctor Doom. I think Why? that Doctor Doom has been widely unplayable for an extended period of time, and a lot of that is because everything gets to go taller so that splitting into three lanes ends up just losing you two of them. So I my, my pitch for Doctor Doom is either give the base Doom more power, which I think introduces some interesting dynamics in terms of right now when you're playing against Doctor Doom, you know it's five everywhere. Giving just a little bit of flex in there, like let's say it's seven five five, that's way harder to play against. Agree, agree. That's so much agree. harder to play against. Alternatively, six 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 Doctor Doom, because that's funny, and that's the extent of it. I just think that's a funny number, oh. and that would be funny. Uh that is. Those are my pitches. I think Doctor Doom is like when you look at every deck that plays six drops: Magneto, Eliath. Never Doom. Red Hulk sometimes. Never Doom. Scar sometimes. Never Doom. And the more they make these good three drops, like the more they make like three fives, the more it's embarrassing to be putting five power on a lane on the final turn of the game. And I just feel like Dr. Doom needs some freaking love. Give Dr. Doom some love. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, if we do that, okay, firstly, don't give us back the Sandman that I wanted. Yeah, okay, don't, do do that, then. Buff, don't do <laughs> the Sandman. Don't do, right? don't do both. Never do both. It's too crazy. <laughs> I don't want to go back to last year so soon. But anyway, so I, I like the 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 thing whereby the bots are 5-5 five, five, and then the Doom itself is like a six a 7. Okay, 6-7 six, is too much. I guess 6, right? Mm-hmm. Like I like the fact that that's a potential thing because what you mentioned, which is like, if, if Doom is like 6 on itself and 5 and 5, like you really need to think where the one extra yeah. power goes, right? It's yeah, a that, one, that one kind of makes it worth playing something like Doom. I like it as well. Also, there's a very nice Doom variant in the shop that I, I to buy, bought it, it and I might be biased because I bought it. <laughs> no, it's a very, very, very nice variant, it's but I'm not cool. buying it yet because I don't play the Doom. 
Yes! It's very nice. Yeah. yeah, wait, no, this is how we should have pitched it to Second Dinner. Guys, buff Dr. Doom right now. He's you're selling him for a hundred dollars. <laughs> this is the yeah, time. I mean, if it's a six by five, they might consider it, right? Because like I mean it's good for the game as well. Six by five. It's interesting, but yeah. at the same time, it's also a nice variant. But yeah, anyway. Let's talk about the good dog and how he is the only understated guy anyone is ever willing to play. Yep, so we talked about this, like one thing to talk about this in the Frigga topic above. I wanted to give this its own topic because I think it's super important. Like in the grand scheme and scope of Marvel Snap right now for the longest time already, we've been like blessed with three fives and like more than three fives, three sixes, three eights, whatever. And they're all like doing something good, right? But like when you think of like understated trees that you would want to play, yes, there is Mobius, but like the one that truly farms a game and like gives you like the snap potential snap back potential or like destroys an entire deck i think the only one that understated at three costs is cosmo like because you know frigga at, at a three three does enable combos mobius does stop a mockingbird or like a scar but cosmo is the only one that kind of just ends the game you know like you cosmo a mystic and negative you cosmo a hella you cosmo those wong nonsense decks you cosmo agent venom sometimes if they draw it late like Cosmo is the only understated three cost card that can end the game. And I feel like that's something worth talking about for sure. Good dog indeed. Good dog. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the state of Marvel Snap right now, Pokemon Pocket. There's a fair amount of, I would say, dooming in the Marvel Snap community right now, especially with regards to the dynamic that, again, I've been banging on this for a while. If you lose players to Pocket and then they try to come back and they can't get good cards because they missed out on that month, that's a really bad situation to be in, and they need to be focusing on that. And uh, I actually saw Dexter talking about this recently, which is great because his reach is so much more beyond mine, and hopefully it'll get to the right yeah, ears at second dinner. Uh, I feel as though, me personally, I've actually enjoyed playing Pokemon Pocket. I've spent about 250, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I have most of the decks in the game. Right now, it feels very good economy-wise. I will say that in the future, once they start releasing like four sets a year, if I have to keep spending that amount to get all the cards from those sets, it will start feeling a lot less good economy-wise. Uh, but right now, like for example, my girlfriend started playing. She's fully free to play. I'm going to have a video up on a deck in on a, on a separate channel, by the way. Uh, follow that channel, please. It's going to be in the description. And she has access to that deck. Fully free to play. She's like account level 13 or 14, and she basically has the deck that I'm doing a video on. So like there's definitely some good things that that economy has going for it right now. It's just I do worry that right now we're in the phase of the economy where they're not stressing your wallet. And once they start repeatedly releasing expansions, people are going to be feeling that stress on their wallet a little bit more. But I don't think it's a hot take to say that the Pokemon pocket economy, at the very least, even if it was as bad as the Marvel Snap economy, it doesn't feel as bad because it's more fun to engage with. And I do think that this is the kind of thing that Marvel Snap really needs to step up on, in my opinion. I feel like their methods of money making have gotten out of whack. Spotlight caches were good when they first released, but they have been paired with a massive lack of series drops and some behind the scenes numbers that are just not good in my opinion. Like the fact that you know, if the fourth card in any grid cash is 66% to be series four, which wouldn't be a huge problem if there weren't twice as many cards in series five as series four. So what that ends up doing is creating situations where you have all the series four cards and then that becomes 66% to be a thousand tokens every single time. Ridiculous, it's bad. And I think that they really need to take a look at why it is more fun to play Pokemon Pocket and what is preventing them. And I think the answer is lack of having like fodder cards from having packs of their own. That's my that's my read on this is Marvel Snap needs packs and it needs more bullshit cards to feed those packs. That's my read. Yeah, so I'm just going to add like one thing to this this topic. I don't have much to say yet because uh, contrary to what people think, because of my previous video, people thought I've already like become fully invested in Pocket. I actually haven't. I haven't really even touched the game. But like, I definitely want to get a bit involved in the game because I feel like Pokemon Pocket at its core, from what I've watched, is like a very casual style gameplay with a very huge card collection aspect to it, right? Like, I, I think that's kind of good as well. But like, I want to see what I can do in Pocket from my own personal standpoint because... 
like when I brought my brand of gaming to Marvel Snap, I kind of did like I I brought my style of like like content creation to Marvel Snap, but it's very super try hardy, even though it's not like the intention of the game. I want to see if I can bring a try hardy aspect to Pokemon Pocket and see if there's an audience there as well, because I know there is. It's just how big it can be, you know. So uh, and also I love Pokemon, so yeah, that's that's what I intend to do. I intend to like kind of like just like maybe do Marvel Snap, do a bit of Pocket, do other stuff. Like, it, it's interesting because I feel like Marvel Snap and Pokemon Pocket have so many similarities. Like, you can kind of just like, I guess what KM is doing as well, you can kind of like do both games and it kind of like works, you know? Because yeah. the similarity is really there in terms of like the style of like card collection, a bit more casual, like, like gameplay style. But at the same time, like, there's a lot of interest in the game, both games, I would say. And the IPs for both games are super strong. So yeah, definitely exciting times to look forward yeah. to. I've seen people who were worried that I would be leaving Marvel Snap, and I can tell you right now, I have they no always plans. Say that. I have no plans to do that. Uh, any Pokemon Pocket that I play is likely going to be in addition to the same amount of Marvel Snap that I'm always going to be playing, the same amount of videos that I'm always going to be making, and uh, it'll be like, oh, it's a hot location day. I can play a different game kind of deal. Like that's that's gonna be what it's gonna be. Or like, oh, I'm gonna stream for eight hours and then additionally to the normal four that I do, some of them are gonna be pocket, right? Uh videos for pocket. Please check out my second channel. Uh it's KM Pocket. Uh hopefully you enjoy that. It'll be linked in the description. Uh my first video should be up by the time this video is up. A guide to Starmie Articuno. I have a lot of technical stuff to work out. I still have to find my format, find my voice for these videos. I'm working on it. Uh, and hopefully the videos will improve, 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 improve until they are able to sort of uh, catch fire on their own. Right now, I feel like I'm just doing this for funsies and uh, I like a game enough to make the videos on it and I'm already streaming it. So I might as well use the footage from that for a good purpose. That's where I'm at with Pokemon Pocket. I currently have no plans to uh, make that a permanent switch over unless, you know, the numbers become undeniable. And so far to me, they have not been. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, nothing. Just just go ahead. Uh, thank you to everyone who's continued to support me. I'm very grateful to have the position that I do. I'm grateful that people are worried like, oh, man, what if KM leaves? What does that do for like the community? I'm I, I'm grateful that I'm in that position and I don't plan on taking it lightly. Yeah, so apparently based on the previous video right now, this is apparently you guys' favorite Pokemon Pocket podcast. That's all I have to say. Based <laughs> on the comments from the previous video, and I think this will be a trend going forward as well. All right, y'all. Thank you so much for making it through that video. I did want to address something at the end. I know there are going to be people who are going to be like, why did you leave in that conversation about King Atree where there was like a misunderstanding about what he did? And the point of that was to say that I honestly feel like it's instructive. And it's worth understanding that mistakes don't matter as long as you correct them. And I think that that is like a really important thing to grasp where it's like, I, we're both immensely good at card games and it's very easy to still make mistakes. And I want you to know that that means that it's okay for you to make mistakes. I was waiting for you to say something. <laughs> Oh crap! I was thinking like that was the ending on that no, song. It note. can be. I can cut it right now. No, it's fine. I, I also just wanna. I also just wanna say that like honestly, half the time when even when I was playing Marvel Snap or like other games ah. or whatever, I don't read my. I don't read my cards, man. Like. I swear to God, like it can literally be in front of my face, which it is. It says yeah. activate, and I will, I'll read it as on review. Maybe it's my fault. How much? Like maybe it's just my brain. How much but money like, have you made playing card games? Just ballpark it for me. It, it, give me, give me like a number of zeros at the end. I mean, definitely five at least. <laughs> <laughs> but, but like I don't read the cards man I mean when I was playing Yu-Gi-Oh the cards were all in Japanese I never read them anyway I just memorized the text of online so like <laughs> you don't need to read to win money playing card games you don't just win <laughs>